So the moment we the moment we inject a transmission, a frequency of being, which happens in different ways, first of all people start to come home to their body. And that changes everything. It literally changes everything. Hey there, and welcome back to the Quotidian Podcast. I'm Bradley Dennis. I know that it's been a few weeks since our last episode, and I apologize. There's lots happening here, including an unexpected run of COVID through my household, just in time for the holidays. But we are back, and we're recovering. And we have an amazing episode for you with Mr. Nicholas Yanni who over the last 20 years gained an international reputation for his transformational coaching and leadership development seminars. The clients he's served include FedEx, Intel, Microsoft, eBay, the list goes on and on. He's also worked with the UK permanent secretaries and several cabinet ministers, but he's got an unusual take. He really bridges the worlds of creative and personal and spiritual and professional development in a uniquely powerful and relevant and very accessible way. What first attracted him to me was he started out his career as a theater director. He actually taught at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, directed his own theater company, and he spent 30 years researching the theory and the practice of the zone of peak performance and studying multiple mind and body disciplines, subjects near and dear to my heart. In 2001, he left the theater to co-found the arts-based leadership development consultancy called Olivier Mythodrama, and in 2013, he founded his own consultancy called Core Presence. He was also an associate fellow at the Oxford Said Business School, and he currently teaches regularly at the IMD Business School in Lausanne. Nicholas and I spoke about presence in coaching, which is a subject I've delved deeply into as a result of my own coaching training lately. We also talked about the differences between being and doing, and these are all topics he examines closely in his new book, which is called Leader as Healer. Nicholas is an amazing man with an incredible depth of knowledge and a real passion for helping people. I also want to take this opportunity to share with you my new coaching program, which is called Awake and Roar. It's focused on helping middle-aged men and single fathers cope with some of the challenges around men's mental health, especially depression and anxiety. And you can find that information on awakeandroar.com. So thank you as ever for being here and for your continued support. And now please enjoy the studied and masterful presence of Nicholas Yanni. Well, Nicholas, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to The Quotidian. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bradley. I'm excited to talk with you. Wonderful. And also, congratulations on the creation of what I think is an exceptionally well-written and much-needed book, Leader as Healer. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a title that four or five years ago would not have had a lot of traction, and yet it's been really warmly received in many quarters. So I think that's a sign of our times. Yeah. Well, that that might actually be a great um, entry point for this is what has changed in the zeitgeist that makes this this book and this work um, available to people now? What has changed that they're they're more receptive to this than they were, say, five or 10 years ago? Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm part of a number of people who for some years have said that our culture is sitting on very shaky ground and it's somehow held together somehow 
Um, then there was COVID, and I remember a few of us saying, wow, maybe COVID will really change something. And then at the end saying, actually, unfortunately, it wasn't bad enough. It wasn't mm. bad enough. Then we had the, we have the war. So basically, you know, I think the world is in a state of unraveling. And I think more and more people see that and feel that. And uh, a title, I think more and more people realize that it, however you t understand the word, healing is needed. Yes. It's ironic to, to kind of point out that COVID wasn't bad enough and and I, I completely agree that I know I, I think know. in the er, in the early days of that experience we all had this sort of duality relationship to COVID which was wow this is terrible and there's going to be a lot of suffering and also there was this sense of reset and much needed retreat all the images of wildlife roaming deserted streets and seeing the sense of the world start to close over an open wound that that maybe there was something there and that perhaps that's what revealed the the necessity here but that it didn't we didn't go quite far enough and we've almost overcorrected in some ways um one of the sort of the focal points of the book and and one I'd like to start with is this concept of being and doing, which I think on the surface seems very clear, but perhaps uh, for a lot of folks, as they sink into what those meanings are, they don't see a lot of uh, difference between the two. Could you take a second and, and sort of illustrate what you mean by the difference between being and doing? Yes, certainly. I mean, as a matter of fact, they could not be more different. Because let's say it like this: when when um, when I present this in leadership training groups and I explain the difference, pretty much everyone understands that our culture has normalized the primacy of doing. Doing mm -hmm. is is a very forward motion, proactive. Uh, energy towards the world which of course has a very important place but within it people are deeply disconnected from their body from their emotions from a sense of inner spaciousness actually from a sense of deeper presence presence meaning i'm here i'm really here yes. so the moment we the moment we inject a transmission a frequency of being which happens in different ways First of all, people start to come home to their body. Mm. And that changes everything. It literally changes everything. You know, if you you take, let's say someone goes to a good yoga class and they come out onto the street afterwards, for at least some minutes, reality is completely different. Yeah. Why? Because they've reconnected to the unembodied experience that is at the very core of being. Now, we have deeply left that. Mm -hmm. That's one of the core themes of my book, because it's catastrophic. We've located ourselves primarily as thinkers. And in that, we've normalized that, and we seem to have forgotten that thinking doesn't feel anything. And that thinking, as Einstein invited, should be our servant, not our master. Mm -hmm. Or as Ian McGilchrist would say, and we spoke about him a moment ago, the left brain is supposed to serve the right brain, but the left yes. brain has taken over and yes. forgotten. It's forgotten its true role. So the right brain is very much more associated with a, an experience of being, a sensory relationship to the world, a connected yeah. relationship to the world. And you know, it's interesting, in his book he quotes an, an experiment where in a lab, they, you know, obviously they can easily switch off left or right brain. So someone who was functioning without any right brain activation, pure left brain, would look at his hand and actually say, 
whose hand is that? Mm -hmm. That's pretty incredible. Complete that disembodiment. In our left brain modality, we have zero, zero feeling of our body. And that's how most people are, Bradley. That's mm. how most people are. You know, I, I, I often in, in training, I invite people to remember the last time or the times when they feel really good in their body, really deeply at home in their body. And everyone can have a sense of that. And then I ask, okay, so in your normal working day, what percentage of the time do you feel that in your body? The answer is between zero and 5%. Wow. That's how disconnected our culture is. That's how entrapped we are in doing. So, but one important thing is the way I teach it, it's not either or. The presence is like we have a bowl of being inside that we're mm -hmm. resting in. And then we have a, out of that arises an arrow of doing, which can be very fast, very gentle. It depends on what I'm meeting. But I rest inside in the sense of being embodied. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I call peak performance. And that some people call that flow that's the sort of the athletic zone people have called that yeah one of the things that exactly. deeply attracted me to your work in particular was from my own experience in history as a theater creator and performer is that sense of being and doing that you get on the stage and when you're really connected yeah to the inner landscape both of emotion uh sensation and connection to yourself and to your ensemble that from that platform you can also reach out across the threshold and experience the other and experience the audience and so i know you have a, a real robust and rich history in theater and theatrical work and so i'm curious about that in particular, but also how you port that forward and what you see the connections are between the work you're doing now and the work you did, say, with Grotowski or uh, with Theatre Ons in, in Switzerland. Right. Yeah, well, I spent literally 20 years researching what you're calling the flow state with actors. Mm -hmm. um, and it was amazing. I never thought I would stop doing that, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that, as you, as you well know, is a state of total embodiment, where as, in an, as we were in, as children, our body is feeling everything. Yeah. Or as Grotowski put it, the gap between yeah. inner impulse and outer action is demolished. And there are one or two actors, very few in the contemporary world who, who you can see have that, where you look at their face, they're not apparently do anything, but their whole inner world is transparent. I don't know if you've seen that film, new film with Eddie Redmayne, The Good Nurse. I have not, uh, but I will now. It's very powerful. It's very powerful film. And he has that. It's really very, very high level of acting. You get his whole inner world just from the way he's looking. So why? So what's the connection? In some way, it's a very direct connection because also in that space, you are a vessel. You're not creating. Mm. It was like when an actor would come to me and say, oh, I don't know what to do with this Shakespeare speech. And my response was always, I don't care what you want to do with it. It's actually not interesting. What yes. will be interesting is what, what will it do with you? Yes. If you can enter a state of deep presence and then you start working with this extraordinary language and that you allow it to do something with you, mm. that's creativity. But that's also in a team meeting what happens when a, a team know how to sit in that deep presence? And then that's when real innovation starts. Ideas right. come. And it's totally different from doing. Um, I was speaking with the CEO this morning about this, and he really got it. 
You know, we don't do creativity. We don't do innovation. We have to understand that. We have to be receptive to it. So in that way, there's a very direct connection because the receptivity arises when we're deeply embodied. Yes. It's one of the most clear connections. Yeah. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in, you know, you started to talk about, you know, like your conversation with, uh, that you had this morning that in, in the board meeting, in, you know, in the group, in, in, a, any context team context outside of the theatrical the mechanics are the same yeah right it's the it involves a listening as much right. as a, a pre, it's an inner listening to oneself and and an availability to everyone around you how do you teach that how do you open that up for people who say don't have the experience of the theater or of of that play except as children, perhaps. Right. Through a multi-level approach, mm. which I explain and then we experience. So that multi-level approach, the main components of it at first are deep somatic work. So I, I take people through whole processes of really feeling their body again. And, and it's revelation for some people. So that's a very important part of it. And I teach practices about how to stay connected. How, mm. you know, because otherwise people have this deep experience and they're sitting in their chairs afterwards like, wow, I feel incredible. And then mm -hmm. 10 minutes later, they take a break and they're on their phone and it's They're finished. <laughs> so I teach practices about maintaining that. Now, yeah. the most, the biggest breakthrough threshold in many respects is the emotional one because yes. the suppression of emotion is one of the ways that keeps our whole system frozen so first we have to demolish the idea of positive and negative emotion we have to make it right. safe enough for people to be vulnerable and i have certain ways of doing that and it always happens on the second day it's like the mm. floodgates open and suddenly there's yes. a lot of emotion and that's game changing because once that happens, people's nervous system is really more unified. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're already in a very, very different conversation and state. Uh, and all the time I'm working with mindfulness all the time with, with the principle of, and I explain that by, um, actually a beautiful image in the Jewish tradition where they say if you open a book you have all the black letters and that's mainly only what we think about but there's also a white page mm. there's also a white page and that white page is, is a profound value and you wouldn't be able to read the letters if it weren't for the white page that's that yang yin right that's, <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> that's that they also they true. rest yeah. on one so another, you know saying. the answer to your question is um, yeah yes the answer to your question is a, through a multi-level approach mm. and i also you know i explain that in my mind any real development particularly leadership development has to go along two parallel streams one is the meditative one is the body work one is everything that opens us but without this which is where we meet our our emotional wounding our personal intergenerational sometimes collective wounding this is mm -hmm. not enough so i talk a lot about trauma mm -hmm. uh, the longer we work the more we actually can work with that but it's very eye-opening for people just to understand what we're all carrying. Mm -hmm. And um, that unless we address that, we're mm -hmm. only dealing with half the picture. And that's the least addressed part in most corporate training and certainly in yes. most corporate coaching. I don't know many uh, methodologies that really touch that because it's not cognitive. 
the only thing that's right. needed, the only thing that's needed with our emotions is to feel them. Mm -hmm. And most work will do anything other than that. And getting to a place of non-judgment about our feelings, right? That, that sense of the emotions come up, they're neither good or bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And the more we can welcome them, the deeper the unification is. You know, particularly mm -hmm. now, emotions like I feel lost, I feel helpless. Well, instead of trying to change that, let's just really embrace that. It's radical. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while for people to really accept that because we're so and, conditioned to try and heal those things. Right. And so sourcing in the body, getting someone to start becoming aware somatically of what lives below the neck, that's that's where trauma exactly. lives. That's also where yeah. the emotions reside. And exactly. by by getting in touch with that yes. and that feeling, then you can move. You can move through them. You can move with them. Right. That's that's quite a process for a lot of people. Yeah. It, it's a it's a huge threshold. Huge. Yeah. Because and and one of the main um, bridges or obstacles, let's say, I, I call it moving from narrative to experience, because that's the other way mm. of describing our culture of absence, is that we're in a constant narrative. We're constantly talking about everything, mm -hmm. but it's disconnected. Now, in the narrative version of the world, we feel we have some control when we move into experience when there's no control you can't control your experience you can only experience it and that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest gateways in this threshold am i willing to give up trying to be in control am i mm -hmm. willing to just feel what i feel can you talk a little bit about the the muscle of attention in this process and how one directs one's attention through that? Right. You showed me a really beautiful little, was it like a tile you had before we started? Can My you mother, read it? Yeah. It's, made, <laughs> it's it says, amazing attention story. is a moral act, which is a quote from Ian McGilchrist's first right. okay. major book, the master and his emissary. Ah, okay. I didn't remember that. So, attention is a game-changing action, if we call it an action. The first thing for a lot of people is to understand that paying attention has nothing to do with thinking. Because at first, you they get conflated. Paying attention mm -hmm. is a much more primary function. It starts very simply with let's pay attention to our breathing. And you see there, even as I say that, there's a slowing down. There's a mm -hmm. slowing down. Let's just notice the sensations as I breathe in and as I breathe out. So that's like the first gateway and if someone really starts to do that the interesting thing and we know this now um, that our brainwave frequency measurably changes the mm. moment we actually start noticing and paying attention our whole state changes that's very powerful so then we, of course, we go deeper and deeper and we refine our attentional capacity more and more. And then comes a critical practice where we understand the possibility of paying attention inwardly and outwardly at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mastery practice. That's a mastery of presence. I fully feel my body, my emotions, if emotions are rising, and I fully feel the outside at the same time. 
and that what, that takes practice, 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 and and there's no end to the depth of that. Yes. I think most people, Bradley, walk around. They don't really notice what's happening around them. I th I think most people don't are in such a bubble that they don't really notice what's happening around them. I didn't. I didn't yeah. used to, compared to now. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that <clears throat> kind of woke me up to to what I wanted to do, especially. <clears throat> as you mentioned in the pandemic and sort of seeing the I want to call it the epidemic of of meaninglessness in people's lives especially in young people my experience touching back on on theater and working in physical theater was that I was enamored of the process of being awake in my body and being awake to the world and and I've call it this sort of omnidirectional awareness exactly. Exactly. that that I could I didn't really exactly. care about the performing it was it was the process the generating <laughs> safe space in which me and my fellow creators right. could listen could deeply delve in research to material that we felt was salient uh, something that was important to port forward but those right. were the things right. that I felt most important about bringing from my theatrical experience forward. And I, I hear that very much uh, right. echoed in, in what you're saying is that what we are looking for, what is sorely needed yeah. is this ability to sit with ourselves in the moment to have that inner awareness and the simultaneous availability and listening to the outer. That that's where we have meaningful conversations. That's right. where innovation comes from. That's where the creative spark actually happens. So there's not a exactly. question there, I, I <laughs> but it's a more. it's a noticing for sure. <clears throat> no, but I, I I couldn't agree more. That's why I define presence in one way as I'm here and I'm available. Mm -hmm. That's like mm -hmm. a core definition of presence. And by the way, what you said, um, I think that's partly why, in the late seventies, Grotowski stopped doing theatre. It mm. was no longer as interesting for him as the exploration of exactly what you've just spoken about. And when yeah. I went to Poland, we didn't do theatre. We did crazy, wild, extreme physical work out in nature, all mm. of which was intended to open deeper and deeper mm -hmm. flow. And, and, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's a digression. But the only way they knew how to do that was through physical extremity. Right. And later, when I brought the work to England, I realized that's not okay. And they, <laughs> it's not okay. It's, it's actually damaging in the end. Yes. No, it's it's a whole other it's a whole other conversation. Yeah. That. But, yeah. yeah. Let's. Uh, I'm diving into the book in uh, chapter four, which is all about purpose. Mm -hmm. A life of purpose, sort of the principle. I, I just finished a, a graduate program um, in depth psychology and in, in Jungian work, basically the psychology of creativity. So I was very wow. excited to see uh, mm. this reference here where you quote him and you say, living without purpose is one of the most grievous wounds of all to the soul. And that the two central right. questions that right. arise out of that for you are what is the work that is mine to do? And also, what is it that's being asked of me? And I'd love to hear you dive a little deeper into how we explore that for ourselves. Mm. Thank you, Bradley. Well, it's interesting because purpose is actually becoming one of the most dominant parts of my work at the moment, um, which is an interesting step and it's kind of happened naturally. And I think that's because at this time more than ever, we are called to know what we stand for. 
you know, the world is getting more and more toxic, more and more fragmented. Mm. So leaders and organizations, I believe, really need to know what you're standing for and what you're standing against. Who are you in this world? Mm -hmm. And of course, purpose is exactly that. Um, <clears throat> so once people, okay, we do a whole exploration of that. And then we come to those two questions that you, 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 you mentioned, for which again, I thank you. Because the first one is a self-knowledge. And, and the phrasing is very important. I, am, I like to be very precise with words. So what is the work that is mine to do mm. is a kind of inner, it's like a pairing away to an essence of who I am. Mm -hmm. Who am I really? And, and it's, I think it takes a long time, for instance, it takes a long time to um, gradually reduce the whole fitting in drive because I think far more than most people realize we're driven as we were in childhood by a, a very deep need to fit in yes and that inherently compromises yeah. the essence of who we are because then we start we don't know anymore what's really mine to do. And we realize, well, I don't even know why I chose that profession or even on a more everyday level, I don't really know who I am. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a lifelong pairing away to come to a deeper and deeper sense of what is my work? Who am I? What am I here to do? Which is a mixture of what I love doing it's a mixture of what my real gifts are. It's a mixture of what breaks my heart in the world. What am I here to really contribute? That's me, 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 me. And then there is what I would consider a deeper question, which is both individual and group. And the individual version is, what is it that is being asked of me now? So that requires such a a strong level of listening, of surrender, surrender of what I want to do. No, it's not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I know what is my gift. I know what I can contribute. So what is the universe asking of me now? What's the next step? And can I hear that? And can I follow that? Again, we're in the following. It's a bowing. And that's a big step for many, many people. It's not, what do I want to do? It's what's being asked of me. And then, which we get to in groups sometimes, what is being asked of us now? now? You know, we go into deep reflection and then people just speak what's coming to them. If it's, let's say, a team. Mm -hmm. um, or even a group of uh, leaders from different countries in a program at the business schools where I teach. As a group of senior leaders, what's being asked of us now in the world 2022 and we get some amazing statements arising from that but it's a it's a it's a it's a deep level of being and a deep level of listening yes that was exactly the word that came to me as i was hearing you talk about this is that you can't do that work until you're able to connect to that listening to understand and to know what it is that you're feeling yeah. about things, to have some experience. My focus is, has been lately on working with young people, on helping them cultivate the tools of self-knowledge, mm -hmm. understanding. There's such a crisis of identity right now. People are struggling with anxiety and depression, and so much of that is derived from both the lack of attention and the lack of an, inab or an inability to listen to themselves and to the world so it's nice to hear you exactly really key into that and it is a muscle yes. <laughs> that we strengthen it, it's it's a muscle that we can yeah throughout our life just the same with embodiment i'm sure it's true for you that my experience of embodiment just gets deeper and deeper literally yes. sometimes uh, maybe after a particular strong bit of inner work 
the next day I actually notice why wow, I'm walking differently <laughs> something really changed in my body so I'm particularly interested right now in in what it is that you want to see happen as a result of your work where does this work take you and where does it take us just the little questions here um yeah <laughs> well you know what's interesting is that the one of the biggest projects i've been involved in this year um is with one of the world's biggest law firms and we've done five retreats we've done my team have done 200 one-to-one -one coaching sessions wow leader is healer and we're yeah. just about to embark on a whole new phase of work around purpose so part of my offering at the moment is a transformational process with one organization um and it's proving it's getting more powerful than i could have ever imagined actually mm. uh and getting we're getting some incredible feedback about the effect on the firm so another part of is the training i offer coaches so i'm actually running two tr transformational coaching programs at the moment one because it's with a group in australia and the other is a more global group um and then you mentioned something that i feel a big call to although it hasn't yet really manifested although it may be about to which is to work with young people frankly because i know that i have a lot of essential skills and tools and i believe being young at the moment is really challenging given what's yes. going on in the world yes, and I'm actually getting involved in a fantastic project um, with Bob Anderson of the Leadership Circle and Leo Burke who's quite a well known figure and they're putting together a whole program of elders and young leaders and I've been asked to be one of the facilitators on that so I'm very excited about that that's starting in London in February um uh, and you know i'm listening all the time like i said i'm listening what's calling what's calling mm -hmm. we've launched a new coaching platform which is again my team and i six of us we've been exploring something that shouldn't be possible and yet we found it is which is to do profound work in just 30 minute coaching sessions and we call it matrix coaching and people understand the principles we have actually an incredible website it went live a week ago so people who come know we will give them just two minutes at the beginning to present your issue and we time it so you need to prepare your narrative and then we jump straight to what's happening inside you let's really feel what's happening and we and we've done 240 of these sessions and we and our clients are regularly astonished by what happens so i'm very excited about that and we've just trained we're training 11 new people to do this work so and the person with who i co-founded this has a vision of this going to tens of thousands of people and it's very, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say, but it's very time efficient. It's 30 minutes. And um, we go outside normal time. Sometimes within 20 minutes, we're like, I think we're finished. And we've touched deep trauma. <laughs> wow. And, uh, wow. Or, or big awakening, you know, or big awakening or both in 20 minutes. There's something about the, it's. We feel we're being taught. You can feel my excitement. We're being mm -hmm. taught as we do this. We're working totally with frequency. We're working direct with energy. Mm -hmm. um, so we're quite. We're very excited as a team. We feel that something is birthing through us. That it's new. And I have co uh, psychotherapists in my team who initially said, "No, no, no, no." no. 
30 minutes you can't do that no 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 what about the follow-up what about the no 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 and they're yeah. like saying wow okay something remarkable is happening here so yeah. that's a whole platform that i'm overseeing you know which could serve thousands of people in the end yes it's called matrixcoaching.net and actually people can already people can already book sessions direct from the website that's wonderful one of the things i hear behind your voice also is the understanding sort of implicit in this work is that while you do have and your team has an enormous amount of expertise in this area and the work that you're doing comes from uh, a deep yeah. basis of knowledge you are remaining present and open in the moment to being teachable that in this work there it's a two-way street totally. <laughs> that you are growing in the same moment yeah. that your yeah. your client is growing and that to deny that or to to state anything other than that would be a denial of the relationship that exists in that coaching dyad and so that's very heartening very exciting to hear about as mm. a growing coach myself that is very committed to right. doing right. the exact same work that I'm encouraging my clients to do that's that is I think right. the difference remaining vulnerable and demonstrating yes. vulnerability in that work right it's so beautiful how you say that honestly i would say that i'm learning more than at any other time in my life right now how and, exciting and i really celebrate that and learning at all levels all levels including doing my own intergenerational trauma work big piece happened a couple of weeks ago with that but also with the higher levels i'm i've never been in such a rich learning yeah that's wonderful i'm really curious for you nicholas mm. you know i started this podcast to explore creative energy in everyday life and it's sort of pivoted as i've trained as a coach and really started to focus on the questions that we're examining here today i'm curious for you and i hear a lot of excitement in the work that you're doing but where do you find you connect to creative energy and creative expression in your life right now? Mm. Your questions are getting more and more touching. <laughs> <laughs> it's really lovely. Um, <laughs> well, again, in different ways, uh, through my marriage, my wife and I are in such a beautiful journey together. For me, very much through nature, Mm. and very much through music i'm i'm uh, first of all i'm already a quite high level percussionist gem djembe drummer but also the last four years i'm i'm studying the oud the arabic instrument oh beautiful which is one of the most soulful instruments i've, I've ever heard yeah so that's a i mean it's a really difficult instrument but i get a lot of deep pleasure from um from that learning journey mm -hmm. and conversation you know relations brad i have a wonderful circle of close friends all of whom are deeply devoted to life and growing mm. and I, I i think more than ever relationship is is fundamentally important so to have sanghas whatever we call it you know small yes. circles communities Plus, plus all the groups I run, all the all the you know trainings I run, I get huge learning and and creative um, insights from that from those as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, how lucky is that to be doing work we love and and to be <laughs> learning through doing it? Yes. Yeah. When people, it's, you know, the the idea. Good. I was with a friend the other night, and she said she's seventy something. And she said, people ask me, when are you going to retire? And I say, well, why would I retire? <laughs> What's ridiculous? <laughs> so I feel the same. That's wonderful. That's <laughs> What's wonderful. the meaning of retiring? I mean, That's seriously. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. If retire from what? <laughs> <laughs> from what? <laughs> 
Yeah. So yes, all of those things, you know. As of a few years back, we bought a, a little house in Puglia in South Italy, and we have seventy olive trees, and oh, it's a, it's a little haven. I mean, it's such a place of nurture. Mm -hmm. The lands there, the landscapes, we we feel very nurtured by that. Yeah. So nature again. Yeah, I'm very touched deeply to hear you talk about the importance of community and you mentioned the word sangha and one of the things that I think is yeah. deeply missing especially in young people's lives right now as relates to mentorship and leadership is the community yes. I think one of the things that the internet resent kind of presents and represents to young people is a sort of community even though it's it's a facade in so many ways that that's where they're reaching to try to find connection and to hear you talk yes. specifically about this program that you're embarking on in February that actually brings yeah. together and embodies the community that so many people are hung young people in particular are hungry for um, is is really heartening. I'm I'm glad to hear that. Right. That's that's important work. Right. Right. Yes. And I do find, um, in its own way, like I'm my transformational coaching program is very global. It's 24 people, east and west, and you know, being together three hours online every two weeks, it's very it gets very intimate. Mm -hmm. So that's the best use of technology, I think, as well. You know, that a group can come together from all over the world. We share very deep spaces together, yes. very emotionally vulnerable spaces. And and we're holding it. You can feel the presence of the group. So, I, you know, there is a big negative factor in technology and also if we use it well i think it's incredible mm -hmm. so as we're wrapping up our conversation i always ask the same question as the final question to my guests and and i think your book may represent a large portion of the answer to this but i'll pose it to you anyway what is the question that's not being asked right now? The question that is not being asked. To be perfectly honest, Bradley, I don't have an answer to that. Mm. And I don't want to I don't want to give an answer that I don't have. I appreciate honesty. Do you have an answer to your question? Mm. Mm. no one's ever turned the mirror back on me before <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm curious actually where that question comes from as well maybe that's my question is where is that question coming from? yeah <laughs> the whole reason I've pivoted back into this work into exploring the questions of presence that I was so enamored by when mm. I was doing theater was to find a way to help people derive meaning and purpose in their life. That we had, I felt like we had come to a point where there was so much disconnection and so much confusion yeah. and so much noise and very little signal that it was difficult for people mm. to to listen deeply to themselves to be available to themselves right. and thus be available to the world that that was something I was gifted as a, at a very early age and has guided my life and I mm. so that's if I were to formulate that into a question it would be how do I deepen the connection to myself so that I can be more available to to serving the world and mm. that's the answer this is the work that you're doing this is the work that 
I'm called to do. <laughs> so, so you've asked right. the question right. already, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ask a lot of questions all the time, so it's hard to think of one that's not being asked. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah. And is there something that I should have asked you, or that you would have you would like to address that we didn't touch? Um. Nothing specific. No, I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I think that maybe I'll finish with, you know, I watched the, because we're using this word matrix, um, I watched the movie The Matrix again recently. Mm. And they use it in a different way there, in a way, the, in a sense, the opposite way. Mm -hmm. But um, I do see that what's the, the normalized version of reality is a kind of matrix, as they say in the movie. And what's really needed, I feel to a large, or at least to a very significant degree, I and others around me, we've unplugged from that. And I want to support as many people as possible to unplug, because it's... I think it's absolutely needed to grow and grow and grow the number of people who are at least trying and much of the time bringing in a different frequency because the, the normalized version of reality has a frequency and presence has a much finer frequency. Yes. And that's what's going to create something new eventually, even if along the way things may well get more and more ugly. Mm. We, yeah. we have to have faith. And I, that's a very important word for me. We didn't really touch that. I don't mean religious faith, but I mean, I think one of our dig biggest and most essential challenges and where we really need each other is to stay attuned to what is trying to come in. Yes even as things get more and more ugly around us. How to face what's happening in the world as nakedly as we can while, while staying in touch with something that is trying to be born. Yes. And being a vessel for that as well. Is there a role for ritual in that practice? Funnily enough, the last retreat I did with the lawyers, I brought a dear friend of mine who is a ritual expert. <clears throat> and we concluded the retreat with a two hour ritual. So there is a place for ritual. It's not my gift, but there is definitely a place for ritual. Yeah. 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 Maybe that's fodder for another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, yes. you might want to interview my friend. Absolutely. He works with uh, organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Nicholas, thank you so much for not only your time, but the gift of your work and your presence in every sense possible. It's such a, an honor and a privilege to have a conversation with you. And I hope that we get to meet in person. I'm so intrigued by your work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bradley. It's been a real joy and, and pleasure to be with you. Thank you.